Off you go. Thank you. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our friend James Mungo, who is one of the most Canadian people we know. <laughs> Lou says he and Joni Mitchell could both drink a case of Canada. James received his BSc in geology from the University of Waterloo in 1987. He did his MSc and PhD research at McGill University, working on per alkaline magmatic suites in the Grenville province and on Tertiary in the Azores, graduating in 1993. He then worked at the Berkshire Geo Institute until 1996 on transport properties of silicate melts. After a couple of years of exploration for nickel in northern Quebec, he joined the University of Toronto in 1999 to teach petrology. He moved to Carleton University in 2015, where he now teaches mineral deposit geology. He has continued to work as a consultant since the 1990s, including one year leave of absence to serve as Norant, Norant Resources Chief Geologist during the discovery and delineation of their Eagle Nest and Blackbird nickel and chrome deposits in Northwest Ontario. Lou says to point out that Jim once debunked the work of a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And I'm sure we'll ask Jim to uh, explain that a bit further. So over to you, Jim, and it's really great to see you again. I don't know if I remember debunking, but maybe it was the Black-Scholes equation that you're talking about, was it? I, I think it must be what he's talking about, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, yeah, anyway. Um, thanks for that introduction. <clears throat> and uh, so this is actually a talk that I gave about a dozen times earlier this year as part of the Howard Street Robinson Lecture Tour, uh, which is run by the Geological Association of Canada. And of course, because of COVID, I did the whole thing online. Um, <clears throat> uh, the title is How Do Layers Form in Layered Intrusions and Why Should We Care? <clears throat> Obviously, it's a complicated subject, and all I can do is give you a of a general look at my feelings on some of the key issues that we have to think about when we think about layering and layered intrusions. I don't presume to have all the answers. Uh, and before I go on, I also want to make sure to acknowledge Sam Robb, Chris Jenkins, Yao Jiu Sen, and Sandra Kamo, whose data and interpretations and thoughts are, are sprinkled liberally through this whole talk. <clears throat> and the picture here is some layered mafic rocks in the critical zone in Cameron section in the northeastern Bushfeld. It's a beautiful example of, of fairly fine scale layering in the mafic rock, which is quite typical of layered intrusions. And, and you know, we're, but what I'm trying to really address here is why one of these layers, for instance, is mostly composed of plagioclase, and then a layer right next to it is mostly composed of orthopyroxene. And, and what causes this to happen? And the why should we care part really comes down to the fact that some of these layers are extremely enriched in metals that we want to extract. So understanding how they form uh, will help us in the search for other deposits of the same sorts of things. Uh, I'll skip these things about the GAC uh, and begin here with, with the introduction. I've got a, a, a uh, sorry, I'll just turn, there we go, nope. I've got one of these little bars here in my way. Anyway, um, <clears throat> on the left here is this color-coded outline of the talk. And so I'll be following, each slide will be color-coded <clears throat> according to this scheme. Uh, so I'll start with this introduction and, and I'll address some very basic questions. This talk is meant to be uh, accessible to a, a pretty broad audience. Uh, so how do crystals appear where we see them in the rock? <clears throat> a little bit about how magma solidify. And then I'll address this question of where the crystals form. Do they form where we see them or do they get transported towards and dropped into the places where we see them? And then in this section five, starting at the macro scale, intrusion scale, and then narrowing down to a hand specimen scale, I'll look at, at the way that the layers are distributed in the rock in a very general way. And, uh, <clears throat> and the distribution of minerals between layers or within layers, the modal distributions talk a bit about textures, uh, and then I'll bring out some observations that we've made of the relative, the apparent relative ages, of some important layers in the Bushfeld complex. Uh, I'll present some, some thermodynamic models that, that we've published describing the, the chemical processes, the petrological processes 
that give rise to the rocks that we see. Uh, a little bit of forward modeling of, of, uh, of the changes in composition in, in rocks formed by in situ crystallization versus uh, crystal accumulation, uh, and then summarize and, and conclude. So Laird intrusions are truly amazing phenomena. They're, they're amazing things to study. They're a lot of fun to think about, even if you're not an economic geologist. Uh, but they're also economically important because most of the world's resources of, of <laughs> platinum, palladium, chromium, vanadium, and also perhaps less understood or, or acknowledged, they also contain a lot of titanium, niobium, and phosphorus deposits that are of global importance. And there, a question that really motivates me is, can the mineralization types that we associate with layered intrusions, for instance, the stratiform platinum deposits, can this mineralization style form in other intrusions that are not recognizable as, as layered intrusions? Do the same processes act in different places? Uh, and throughout this, I'll be addressing uh, two big questions that are being debated quite a lot uh, in igneous petrology recently. And, and they're, they sort of overlap, but they're not the same question, although they get they do tend to be conflated in people's minds. And one is this the concept of the big tank. Uh, magma chamber versus a transcrystal mush system, and I'll elaborate on that very soon. And the other is the question about whether crystals form in situ where you find them, or whether they form somewhere else and get carried to the place where we find them. And I'll be, it's a somewhat partisan outlook I'm giving you. I'll show you some of my many reasons to dispute the big tank and the in situ models for most of the Bushfield complex, but not necessarily all of it. <clears throat> so here's a a classic big tank uh, magma chamber, the Skaregard intrusion in East Greenland. And on the left here is a cartoon uh, of the, the general structural setting of the Skaregard intrusion. These numbers here are, are measured in kilometers. So it's a box a couple of kilometers deep and a few kilometers wide, which formed during uh, normal faulting, block faulting uh, on the eastern margin of, of Greenland during the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. And this box just with rigid walls just opened up and filled with uh, ferrobasaltic magma, uh, which then crystallized within this, this rigid container. And on the right here is a cartoon uh, from some work by Ir Irvine in the 90s, showing some, it kind of summarizes ideas people have about what happens in these big tank magma chambers. And, and I don't want to go through these things in detail. The key thing to notice here is that and, and I think most of us would agree that this is true, that at any given time, the Skaregard comprised an inner portion, which was almost 100% liquid. It was a melt body surrounded by the crystallized equivalents of that melt and, and layers slowly aggraded up from the base and also formed growing inward on the, on the vertical walls and even down from the roof surrounding this, this body of liquid as it evolved through time. That's the classic big tank magma chamber model. And it's been applied, um, I think somewhat uncritically to all the layered intrusions in the world in the past. So the Stillwater complex, the Bushveld complex have been argued to have formed in exactly the same manner. On the other hand, there's been an increasing understanding of the fact that, that these so-called transcrustal mush systems are very important uh, end member, I suppose, in, in the way that magmatic systems evolve. Uh, in many different settings in the Earth. So uh, continental magmatic arcs, even island arcs, mid-ocean ridges, which formerly were interpreted in, in terms of these big tank magma chambers, are now understood to have evolved as transcrustal mush systems. <clears throat> so here I need to define the word mush. Mush is, in, in this context, I'm calling a mush any mixture of solids and liquids wherein there's enough solid for the solids to interact with each other. Uh, and this could range from a brittle porous solid that only has a couple of percent melt in it along green green, green contacts uh, <clears throat> to at the other extreme could be crystals suspended in melt but in sufficient abundance that they, they will interact with each other. They'll affect the viscosity of the melt and, and they will uh, perhaps stick to each other and, and, uh, <clears throat> and form uh, well, mushes. And the idea of the transcrustal mush system is that although a large part of the crust in one of these systems might be molten at any given time, uh, most of it is mushy and, and forms a kind of a self-supporting framework of solids within which melts exist. And, and there are transient 
magmatic events in which magma is extracted from one mushy domain and moves up to another. So they have a kind of a staged migration process from the asthenosphere. Uh, and here we're showing the mantle below this dashed line, lower crust, upper crust, and magmas will, will get squeezed out of these mushy zones in the mantle and, and be in place at a succession of different levels in the crust where they then go through their evolutionary process uh, in, in fairly short order. And these melt dominated pockets are short lived and they eventually turn into mush again themselves. Uh, and within a system like this, it's, it's important to note that the melt and the liquid in these mushy domains typically have a long time to reach equilibrium between these short lived events when, when the melt is allowed to migrate different levels. Uh, and so this kind of leads me to this next question of how crystals appear where we find them in, in layered rocks. And there are two kind of fundamentally different ways of thinking about this. And, and here I'll show in a cartoon how this works. And subsequently I'll, I'll address a little more in detail the, the petrogenetic consequences of that and the thermodynamic consequences. So in the one idea, which is at the top here, we have the process of fractional crystallization. And the way this cartoon works is the evolution of the system proceeds from left to right. So on the left here, we have a system which is entirely liquid, which has wall rocks. <clears throat> and as it evolves through time, and perhaps also during transport, so in the spatial sense, from left to right, um, it cools, it interacts with wall rocks, so it may assimilate or it may not assimilate wall rocks. And whether it's just cooling or it's cooling and assimilating wall rock, it will begin to crystallize. And then this fractional crystallization scenario, the crystals are removed from the melt as soon as they form, either by plating out in situ on the walls or by settling to the margins. <clears throat> so at any given time, as the system progresses, it'll still be almost entirely melt dominated. And the solids, are forming a separate system, which is actually physically separated somehow from the liquid. So AFC stands for assimilation fractional crystallization. If you drop the A, it's just fractional crystallization. The other scenario, which I've shown here on the bottom is assimilation batch crystallization. It could also progress without any assimilation. You could just consider batch crystallization. But the difference here is that the crystals that form during cooling uh, remain suspended in the melt. And so that requires some kind of uh, physical process that keeps the melt and the crystals in communication. And, and as I kind of alluded to in the previous slide, you can get these kinds of situations you know, in a mush system as well. In the mush system where the melt and the crystals have a lot of time to sit together, they will reach equilibrium. And then you can suddenly remove melt from it. And you'll have a liquid which has evolved by a process of batch crystallization. Similarly, fractional crystallization could occur if melt is migrating through a mush uh, and equilibrating with the solids as it goes, plating out crystals as it goes, and, and the liquid that emerges from that process might have experienced fractional crystallization. And, and these ideas of fractional versus batch crystallization, you'll see later in the talk that they have big important consequences for, for how layers form and, and what the layers will look like. Uh, but I want to emphasize that there's no direct equivalence between this controversy, fractional versus batch crystallization as a, as a generative process, and the big tank versus trans, transcrustal mush controversy. You can have fractional or batch crystallization in a mush zone or in an open magma dominated, melt dominated magma chamber. Um, now, Magmas obviously solidify from a state of being liquid to being solid. So during that process, crystals form. In some manner, they will stick together and the fraction of melt in the system will decrease through time until eventually the entire mass has become solid. And during that process, you could have multiple solid phases, different minerals coexisting, and there could be a variety of immiscible phases present as well, like sulfide liquid, uh, one or two uh, vapor and, and brine type phases, carbonate melts. Uh, and then complicating factors include assimilation of host rocks. As I've already mentioned, those physical sorting of different crystals from each other or from melt and the removal of liquid from a mushy uh, uh, system to form accumulate rock. 
So here's some pictures that illustrate that. This is a crystal rich lava. It's a picrate from the Azores where these olivine crystals obviously were transported along in this basaltic liquid. Uh, so this is just clear evidence that the magmas can carry crystals considerable distances under the right circumstances. Um, this is a picture from a, a paper by Marian Holness, um, where we have crystals of plagioclase surrounded by glass. And of course, before this rock was, was rapidly cooled, the glass was, was liquid. So this is a, a rock which was a, it had a solid interlocking framework, crystals with a considerable amount of residual melt present as well. So this would also qualify as a mush. In my terminology, this might be around 25% liquid. And, and it's thought that a large part of the crust in transcrustal mush systems exists in this kind of state from which melt may or may not eventually be extracted. If the melt isn't extracted and it doesn't react with any external liquid, then you can wind up with a rock that we would call an orthocumulate, where the crystals that first, through whatever mechanism, came to sit together like this, are surrounded by the crystallized equivalents of the liquid that was trapped between them. So we can think of this as the trapped liquid, and the trapped liquid can solidify around the original package of crystals to form an orthocumulate texture. And at the opposite extreme, that melt may be able to react with, with some external body of liquid, or the, the crystals may compact by a mechanical process uh, until there's no liquid left in between them, and the crystals are all packed together as an accumulate. Now, if we want to think about where crystals come from, we have to think about how they first come into existence. And there are two basic distinct possibilities. One is homogeneous nucleation, uh, where the crystal, the tiny little nanometer scale crystal nucleus appears spontaneously suspended in the melt. Uh, and I've shown that, illustrated that here for vapor bubbles, but it's the same reasoning. You start out with a, a little vapor bubble or a crystal nucleus completely surrounded by melt. And there's a fairly high energy barrier that tends to uh, delay this. The, the crystals are not going to form unless the melt is somewhat supersaturated with that phase. By the way, can you hear that motor running in the background? No. Good. Okay. I can hear it, but I guess my computer is screening it out. Uh, then the, altern the other alternative is heterogeneous nucleation, which uh, has a much lower energy barrier. A vapor bubble or a new crystal can form attached to an existing interface. In this case, it's shown as a solid melt interface with a vapor bubble on it, but crystals often form on the edges of other crystals. Uh, and because of the way that the surface energies work out, this typically causes a lower uh, energy barrier. And therefore, this heterogeneous or in situ nucleation is actually uh, favored thermodynamically compared to heterogeneous nucleation. However, we know from experience and observation like this, that, that crystals can and, and generally do form by homogeneous nucleation, even though there is some thermodynamic uh, preference for in situ heterogeneous nucleation. <clears throat> now I'm gonna come back around to this idea of batch versus fractional crystallization. <clears throat> And I'll do it with reference to this ternary phase diagram. If you know how these diagrams work, that's great. You can follow along. If you don't, I apologize, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Because normally it takes me about a week to explain this in an introductory petrology course. So this is the ternary system. Uh, anorthite, where's my pointer? I've lost my pointer. There it is. Anorthite, forsterite, diopside. So compositions plot out into this ternary in the usual way. Uh, and what's shown here is one composition, we'll call it composition A, which uh, when it's in the completely liquid state is a mixture of these three components, uh, which also happen to crystallize as these phases, anorthite, diopside, and force, right? And if you cool that liquid down from a super liquidous state, then at, temp at 1700 degrees C, it will begin to form crystals of forsterite. And the crystals have this composition. Um, and in this batch or equilibrium crystallization scenario, the liquid from which forsterite crystals are forming will start to move 
directly away from the composition of forestrite. The more forestrite you make as the temperature goes down, the more the liquid just by mass balance will have to move away from forestrite. And so at these successively lower temperatures, your system will comprise liquid, let's say at this composition at 1400 degrees and a fair amount of forestrite crystals. And then when you reach this composition here, you're at what's called the cotectic. And this cotectic defines the, the range of compositions at which diopside and forestrite will coexist at equilibrium with the liquid. So in a system which is evolving at equilibrium where you keep the crystals within the system, thenceforth, the temp as the temperature goes down, the liquid will follow this trend here along the cotectic. Uh, and the mineral mode will now consist of variable amounts of diopside and forestrite. The lower the temperature, the more diopside compared to the amount of forestrite. So in a system evolving by equilibrium crystallization, once you've reached the liquidus, then your system is always partially molten. It will include solids and liquids. And the mineral mode will vary continuously with temperature or with bulk composition. If your bulk composition was somewhere else and you cooled it to this cotectic, um, then you'd see, again, a varying proportion of these two minerals as the temperature changed. And so if you're carrying around a batch of, of crystals suspended in a liquid um, and you move that liquid, that, that mush around, I'll show in, in subsequent slides that sorting is almost inevitable. The crystals will, will tend to separate themselves because they have different hydrodynamic properties. On the other hand, in, a, in, in the fractional crystallization scenario, me. <laughs> giving talks outdoors. Okay, uh, in fractional crystallization, there's no re-equilibration between the melt and the solids. By definition, in a fractional uh, crystallization scenario, the solids are removed from the system instantaneously as they form. So by de definition, your thermodynamic system uh, is 100% liquid at all times. There's only ever an infinitesimal amount of solids. So if you think about that in, in real terms, that would be like a, a big tank magma that's forming crystals. And as they form, they're removed from the, from the magma chamber. So they'll pile, form a pile of crystals at the bottom. <clears throat> um, and this imposes some really strict constraints on the solids that can form at any given time. As long as you're forming only forestrite, then you'll be making layers of pure dunite. And then when you reach this cotectic, you'll form layers that comprise diopside plus forestrite. But the proportions of diopside and forestrite in that layer, which is now forming, are um, so the solids that are forming here have fixed cotectic proportions, which are actually given by the, the tangent of this line. If you follow the tangent to this curve back to this join, that tells you the proportion of diopside and forestrite in the, in the layers that are going to be forming here. Hi, your mom just came. <laughs> so it's just me now. Sorry for the distraction. So the key point here is that if this magma is evolving by fractional crystallization, it'll form dunite, and then it'll form a peroxinite with a little bit of forestrite in it. And, uh, and the proportions are fixed. You can't have variable proportions of solids in accumulate rock that's forming during fractional crystallization. And now I'll introduce you to this idea of paratectic reactions. The, a paratectic reaction involves an incongruent melting reaction. For example, in this binary here, which has temperature on the y-axis and the mole fractions of forestrite versus silica on the x-axis, <clears throat> uh, you can define the instantite composition here in the middle. If you start it out in a, in a solid of pure instantite composition, when you heated it up to this temperature, it would begin to melt incongruently. So it would leave a solid residue of olivine and a liquid would start to form with this composition of P. If you take a system in, in this binary phase diagram and cool it down, uh, during fractional crystallization, you'll start with some liquid up here above the liquidus. It cools to the liquidus temperature and crystals of forestrite begin to form. So you generate dunite. <clears throat> and as you cool down, the liquid composition evolves to become more silicic until you reach point P. So you're forming dunite all the way down to here. When you reach point P, 
The solidifying assemblage instantaneously switches from olivine to orthopyroxene. The liquid continues to evolve down here and you switch from mecindonite to orthoperoxenite. But during equilibrium crystallization, <clears throat> when you reach this paratectic point, uh, you're, you're slowly accumulating more and more olivine, keeping it in equilibrium with the liquid. When you reach point P, if you continue to remove heat from the system, then the olivine that's already formed will begin to react with the liquid to form orthopyroxene. And then until you have used up all the olivine, you'll have a mixture of orthopyroxene and olivine coexisting at equilibrium with the milk. Uh, when you have multiple components, this doesn't hap all happen all at once at a single temperature. It gets spread out over a range of temperatures. Uh, but you still will not see mixtures of olivine and orthopyroxene coexisting in a natural melt, which is evolving by fractional crystallization. You'll have either one or the other. So if you find a cumulate rock, which contains granular accumulations of olivine and orthopyroxene together, that rock must have formed uh, by the accumulation of a batch of crystals that were all at equilibrium together with the melt. That's equilibrium crystallization. The next concept I want to explore is in situ crystallization. I've mentioned it before. It's favored uh, by the thermodynamics that you're, you're more likely, it's easier to start a new crystal growing in physical contact uh, with an existing crystal. Uh, but it will cause some rather, I would think this, I find in my experience somewhat unique textural results. Uh, if the crystal is forming physically attached to a solid substrate, then it has to be happening on the edge of something like the bottom of a magma chamber or on the walls, or I suppose it, it can occur where two crystals are stuck together, suspended in the milk. Um, but you tend to get these very distinct unidirectional growth textures. And here's some examples of, of olivine that grew rooted on the base of a magma chamber on the rum intrusion forms this, this distinctive texture called herosite. Uh, in pegmatites, you get comb texture. Um, and it's inevitably going to lead to fractional crystallization because the crystal is growing attached to a solid and as the solid grows into the melt, it's, it's being removed from communication with the liquid. And it's been suggested that chromite grows preferentially uh, by heterogeneous nucleation. So in this, a uh, thin section published by Vladipov et al. Uh, last year, they're suggesting that these chromite grains, which are all touching each other, actually grew by nucleating one on top of the other. And, and they show in this cartoon, the chromite grains forming these sort of dendritic branching trees rooted on a solid substrate. And then they suggest that other silicate crystals grew subsequently and filled in the gaps between them. Now, there are some issues with this because they're, as they even point out in their own diagram, some of these chromite grains aren't touching other grains and you would think they would fall out uh, if they had somehow managed to form by homogeneous nucleation. Uh, I actually haven't figured out what their response to that objection is. In together, and so they don't record a process of fraction crystallization. And they may or may not be at equilibrium with the enclosing melt, the diffusion through these solid phases is quite slow, so it may not achieve true equilibrium crystallization, but we're certainly not in the situation of idealized fractional crystallization. <clears throat> this process tends to encourage or promote the formation of concentric zoning in crystals. So when we see concentrically zoned crystals, we can infer that they were transported uh, within the magma that was, that was, that was moving or they were moving within a static magma. And experiments have shown, like this experiment published by Faurian et al. in 2015, that when you have mushy accumulations of crystals, uh, if those mushes are induced to move somehow, in this case by slumping, but I'll also show it can happen by, by traction on the base of a flowing magma, they'll almost inevitably sort themselves out into layers. Uh, that's just something you can show quite easily by experiment. There, uh, and I did some, uh, these are ongoing, but I just thought I'd show you this little movie I've made of uh, the form spontaneous forming formation of layering uh, from a suspended 
from a, a viscous suspension. I've made a little flume here, which has an annular shape. It's a ring-shaped thing with paddle wheels that stir it up. It's about uh, a foot in diameter. Uh, and the, the actual flume part is about uh, three centimeters across. So there's a three centimeter wide ring shaped thing here, which I keep moving with these little metal paddles. I've got more work to do, but I think I can already qualitatively show how this kind of system will work. I've made a, a viscous sugar water solution that's 60% sugar, 40% water with a viscosity of a one pascal second. Uh, and I've got a mixture of magnetite and quartz sand in here. And so when I spin this thing up, there's a primary flow. I'll get it going. Uh, and then I'll speed it up at some point so you can see a little better. See, so I've lost my pointer. That's the trouble with using the pointer. I have to turn that off now. Okay. Um, I don't remember how to get back to a regular pointer. Escape. Anybody remember? Let me if I just hit it again. No. Mouse. There we go. All right, back to the mouse. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, here it is spinning. I'll keep talking while it's spinning. So in, in this annular system, it's not a perfect analog to a, a, a sheet like magma flow because it's confined in this little ring. There's a secondary, there's a primary flow around the ring and there's a secondary flow that goes along the bottom from the outside to the inside and then up along the interior wall. Uh, but I think that if we want to just consider whether or not crystals will, will remain suspended, the important thing is just how fast the fluid is moving along the bottom. So I've got turbulent flow here. The paths are random and stochastic. They're not, it's not a laminar flow, uh, except in the boundary layer at the very bottom, where you might see uh, things moving in a slightly more regular pattern. And, and I, can, I can get multiple flow regimes. If I've got the paddle wheel spinning really fast, then uh, everything gets lifted into suspension. I started out with all of the solids on the bottom. And then when I, when I start the flow, everything gets lifted into, uh, into this turbulent suspension, even the heavy magnetite grains. Then if I slow the flow down, then I can pass one critical flow rate at which the, uh, the magnetite grains will not remain in suspension. If they get randomly carried into this viscous boundary layer on the bottom, then they get trapped there and they settle out. But the quartz grains are still uh, have uh, low enough density that at this flow rate, they, they remain in suspension. So you get a very efficient separation of magnetite from quartz. Uh, and you can follow this along until I've basically removed all of the magnetite from that suspension. There's just a little bit left. And then I slowed the flow down to see what would happen. So now the quartz sand starts to come out. And the last little bit of magnetite comes out towards the end. So I actually get, in the end of this experiment, I have a magnetite layer, a quartz layer with some included magnetite, and then a little magnetite leader seam, and then the stuff that was still uh, suspended that fell out when, when the flow stopped completely. Uh, so clearly, and, and I can do this over and over again, and, and, and it's basically impossible not to get some layering no matter how I, how I run the uh, simulation. Uh, so now turning our attention to the Bushfeld. Here's a, you guys all know what the Bushfeld looks like. I think I shouldn't spend too much time on it. Um, it's very big. It's around 400 kilometers in diameter in the, uh, In cross-section here, I've gone a little schematic uh, cross-section of it. Uh, so you can see that it's, it's a, this lopolith is, is actually quite thin. It's essentially a sill, composite sill with many layers within it, uh, which dips inwards toward the middle. 
and I'm taking Sue Webb and Lou Ashwell's stance here that it's probably continuous under younger cover rocks here in the middle, uh, and also perhaps under the rocks into which it's intruded. And, and it breaks down into these layers, which are established uh, on the basis of, of convenience and, and our ability to trace them over very long distances. The lower zone, which is ultramafic rocks, which crops out intermittently around the outer edge, underneath everything else. Uh, a critical zone, which is uh, ultramafic on its bottom and mafic, ultramafic in the middle, in its upper portion, which is divine, defined by the presence within it of chromite, it seems. Uh, and it occurs as this lighter blue unit that runs all the way around, uh, most of the way around the complex. The main zone sits above that. It's rather thicker and it's almost exclusively composed of mafic rocks. And then above that is this ferrobasalt or ferroandesitic uh, unit called the upper or the upper main and, and upper zone, uh, which in places cuts down through all the rest of the stratigraphy and as clearly has formed a little bit later than the rest of complex. Uh, and, and the questions that people are arguing about recently include this question of whether or not this, this whole thick layered sequence, which is up to about eight or nine kilometers thick, formed as a single long-lived magma chamber with an upward evolution from ultramafic cumulates at, at the bottom through a, you know, a series of alternations of ultramafic and mafic to the most evolved compositions on the top. Did this process occur by fractional crystallization? Uh, there's no doubt that there were intermittent uh, pulses of fresh magma that came in, but they may then have evolved internally by fractional crystallization. Or crystals may have been brought in as batches of slush that were deposited on the bottom of this big tank magma chamber. Or it's been suggested by myself and a few other people that at least some of the layers in the system may have been in place as sills within pre existing cumulates. So was this complex uh, the upper portion of a transcrustal mush system, or, or was it a big tank magma chamber? Uh, and if we want to think about layers, here's the one that's the most interesting to a lot of people, because it's got probably the most value in the complex, is the UG2 chromatite. This is what it looks like at the Smoky Hills Platinum Project in the Eastern Bushveld. Um, you can see here this hill with an orthocyte on the top, peroxinite in, on the face here of this, this uh, open cast mine. And at the very bottom of that, that face is the UG2. This is where it runs along. Uh, and they've scraped it away along the hillside here with the bulldozer. Uh, and in fact, you can more or less continuously trace this one package of, of ortho, uh, uh, sorry, of peroxinite and chromatite around the entire complex. So it's around 400 kilometers in uh, diameter and around 20 meters thick. So it has the aspect ratio of a sheet of printer paper a meter wide. And the chromite layer within it uh, is only about 65 centimeters thick. So that has an aspect ratio like a thin layer of paint on top of that piece of paper. And I think, I don't have the hubris to think I know exactly how this layer formed. I have ideas that I like, but it just baffles the imagination how a layer this thin and this continuous could form on this kind of scale. Um, I think any of us who are studying this have to admit that no matter which scenario we envision, it's, it's a very puzzling phenomenon. But it's also very important economically uh, because it's the world's largest single repository of platinum. So that's one very important layer in the bushveld, but there are many others that are more or less similarly continuous. And, and here on this slide, I wanna kind of emphasize the, the less part of that. Um, we've got a series of, of uh, borehole sections here from around the bushveld that were published by Tony Naldred and others. I think one of the authors was, is in on the stock or on it. Um, and the, the rock types in these holes with depths in meters are shown here in different colors. So green is peroxinite, black is chromatite, purple is Hartsburgite, blue is norite, uh, and yellow is anorthosite. And it's conventional to, to correlate these chromatite layers uh, and give them numbers. And uh, I, I 
fully recognize that the people who work here and have done for decades uh, have good reasons for doing that. Uh, but I also would emphasize that some of the people who work here and do this are a lot more uh, hesitant to, to correlate them all. If I had this section of holes, this, this fe uh, fence of holes to correlate in the ring of fire where I worked on, on coma type deposits, I would refuse to draw lines between any of these chromites. I would just say that there's a broad uh, horizon here. You know, we've got hearts, uh, peroxinites at the bottom and a mix of rocks up above. Uh, and I might stick with this idea of a lower critical zone and upper critical zone. Uh, but to correlate the individual layers, uh, I'd be very hesitant. But of course, if you're mining there and you've got hundreds of exposures, then you may have a lot more confidence. And oops, and this is how it's done. We've got the, the UG2 that I showed you running along the top, and it's a very distinctive unit. And I think it's probably is correlatable around the complex. Down here, the convention is to pick the first anorthosite that you see uh, in the in the critical zone and then start numbering the middle group chromatites above and below it based on their spatial relationship to that anorthosite. And this is a, a system that works well. It gives you a name for every chromite layer in your section. Um, but as, uh, as uh, Schoon and Tigler pointed out a long time ago, as you go from one section to another, it's not always clear that, that this particular layer here that you're calling MG1 is the same layer that you see hundreds of kilometers away. Uh, it may be, or it may not be. In places like the still water, it's become clear that these individual layers aren't actually correlatable. They sort of, they pinch and swell and, and come and go. A long strike. Um, another issue, oh, sorry. And another thing to point out here is that these silicate rocks do not have uniform compositions around the complex. So. If we accept that this MG4 chromatite is somewhere around here, the hanging wall of the MG4 isn't the same from one place to another. So the MG4 here in, in the scheme of, of a big tank magma chamber crystallized from uh, a, a magma that was forming peroxinite, but here it crystallized from a magma that was forming norite, and here it crystallized from a magma that was forming uh, Harzbergite. Uh, no, this is this. Sorry, this is a melanorite. Hard to see the colors, right? Um, but anyway, the key point here is that the, the identity of the rocks surrounding each of these ro these chromite seams varies from place to place, which is problematic for the big tank, but it doesn't kill the idea. It just means you need to have special arguments for why uh, chromites would form uh, rather uniformly around the whole complex at a particular time in the evolution of the system, but their hanging wall rocks wouldn't be the same in each case. Another issue with the regional scale to do with layer distribution is the fact that the lower zone occurs in these isolated compartments. So these compartments, as they're called, are separate troughs, which are discordant to the footwall rocks, uh, and are separated by zones of footwall where the critical zone comes right down onto the footwall. So if the lower zone was the first part of the complex to form. That implies that each of these compartments formed as a separate um, sort of blade-shaped, horizontal blade-shaped intrusion. And then that the complex formed, this, the, the critical zone represented a time when these separate intrusions widened and grew together, uh, merging laterally to form this larger magma chamber, which was, was then formed the critical zone. And I've always wondered why, if they were all separate intrusions, if they split the rocks surrounding them and grew laterally, uh, when they have discordant relations to their foot wall, why would they all have suddenly, their, their tips would merge at exactly the same level? You'd think that, that they would come together with screens of sediment between them. Uh, unless they formed under the critical zone after it all was already formed and they were guided to flow in along its base. So. Two not perfectly satisfactory ways of explaining a rather puzzling observation. Another issue that struck me when I went to the Bushveld in 2009 is that there's, there's definitely very large scale out of sequence layering if you expand your, your scope uh, to the whole complex and not just the main part of the Rustenberg layered series. So at Madison, you can, you can go down the river there, I forget the name of the river and see 
when you're in, in below the lower zone here, this big hill is lower zone for iditite and peroxenite. It bottoms out against, uh, you can see chilled margins and, and, uh, and little cells interlayered with metasediments. And then you come down farther and find these rocks that look exactly like critical zone lithologies, including even a layer of chromatite plankton. So norite and orthosite and peroxenite is sitting happily in layers below the lower zone. And so if you accept that these are part of the Bushveld complex, then you also have to accept uh, that these critical zone magmas could either have appeared before the lower zone was formed, which means that you had cyclical evolution of the system on a much more broader scope than, than people generally recognize, or if the critical zone type magma only existed after the formation of the lower zone, then this is clear structural evidence that critical zone magmas could be in place as separate cells external to the main big tank magma chain. Next issue, uh, looking at layering on the layer scale, sort of on the outcrop scale, here's this, this is the picture from the beginning of the talk. Um, we've got these alternations of essentially leuconorite or, or even a northosite with, with melanorite. Um, these are non-cotectic uh, mineral proportions. So it's impossible to form these rocks by fractional crystallization. Uh, without some very, very special circumstances. You really need to, to stretch your arms wide in your arm waving to explain why you get these alternations in a fractional crystallization scenario. Uh, but if you allow for the possibility that there was a mushy pile of, of orthopyroxene and plagioclase crystals on the floor of the magma body, then uh, you could mechanically sort them into layers with more or less of each face. Another issue is the occurrence of paratectic mineral assemblages. Uh, classic example is the granular Hartsburg. I, this picture is from the Stillwater complex. Uh, I don't have a picture of it from the Bushveld, but these things do occur in the lower critical zone. And they occur in man, many other places. It's a common rock type, which we see in the mid-continent rift in North America, America, Canada, Brazil, many other places. So these are rocks with granular co-accumulations of orthopyroxene and olivine. In this case, also with chromite. Uh, and as I explained earlier, you cannot get these co-accumulations by fractional crystallization. Uh, but in a batch scenario where olivine, orthopyroxene, and chromite coexist with liquid in a partially molten system, then you can easily uh, bring them in and, and dump them together as piles of crystals. Uh, the occurrence of concentric zoning in this plagioclase crystal, which is quite common in the critical zone, implies that this crystal grew suspended in, in, in the melt and then collected with other crystals on the bottom. Uh, and then this anti-nodular texture, I call it, where we have uh, a paratectic chromite orthopyroxene assemblage. Uh, chromite grains surround orthopyroxene crystals. You can see it more clearly here. Um, implies to me that the orthopyroxene and the chromite grains existed together, suspended in a melt, and then collected like sand on the bottom of the melt body. Uh, and there's no evidence in textures like these for the occurrence of branching dendritic trees of chromite grains. There are so many isolated chromite crystals that, that uh, had to have been supported by something when they came to rest. And the logical conclusion to me is that they came to rest supported by this the scaffolding of orthopyroxene crystals that were piling up at the same time. We see folding and layering commonly in the critical zone. This is from that same uh, section going up the Cameron section above the, uh, the middle group chromatites. You commonly see folded norite layers, more folded norite layers, often with xenoliths or autoliths, which would be very hard to carry in suspension in a melt, but are relatively easy to carry in suspension in a slurry for long distances. And the same kind of thing here. Uh, all of which suggests to me uh, the emplacement of, of co-accumulation of batches of crystals rather than in situ crystal growth or genuine fractional crystallization uh, near the bottom of the magma chamber. I'm sorry that I'm running a little slow here. I, I'm going to give you guys a chance to weigh in and tell me to either speed through the last slides or carry on a little over. I've got plenty of time. 
No, you carry on, um, James. Okay, thanks. Uh, I haven't given the talk in a few months and I'm a bit rusty, so I'm not whipping through it. <laughs> so Kronos stratigraphy, I could give a whole hour long talk just about that, but I'll just summarize the findings that we had from our work. Uh, it's been, it's had a hostile reception from some of my colleagues and I fully understand that. And, and we are actually are going to great expense to try and duplicate some of these dates and, and really dig as deep as we can to, uh, to verify what, what we think they're telling us. And we have to be very careful what we say when we talk about what the age of a zircon crystal is actually telling us. And so here, first of all, I put some boxes here showing the relative ages of some zircons. This is a, a graph showing depth in a borehole in Tierfontein firm in this, near Pretoria uh, with the, the lithological log here. So got norites, northocytes in yellow, norites again, a different kind of norite in blue and peroxinite in green and some named layers here. We might have bastard reef, I'm not quite sure. We've definitely got Marinsky reef, UG2, UG1 and some middle group chromatites. Uh, and we were able to separate and date zircon and badlyite from some of these layers. And so the ages are shown here on the x-axis, millions of years, so 2055 to 2057. And the key takeaway point here is that these crystals, these zircon crystals formed at ages which are statistically distinguishable with 85% confidence, putting the Marinsky Reef younger than the uh, main zone above it. And the uh, zircons that grew in the, in the middle group two chromatite here can be shown with 99.7 confidence to have crystallized at a younger time than those in the UG2 uh, peroxinite sitting up above it. And we know from thermo, uh, geothermometry that these zircons grew at a temperature about 100 degrees above the solidus at very low melt fractions, when only about 10% melt remained in the rock. Um, and, and the implication here is that these, the norites into which these things were emplaced are older than all of these peroxinites, which are, of course, associated with chromatites. Um, and that would suggest then that this whole sequence comprises older norites within which there's a stack of younger cross-cutting peroxinite chromatite cells that actually may be sequentially younger than town. Could there be a problem with how we're interpreting these ages? Well, of course there could. We're, we're confident of the age of crystallization, but the interpretation is where opinions start to creep in. And, and we did some modeling of heat flow or the thermal evolution of something like the Bushveld to see whether it would shed some light on, on these questions. Uh, and so we looked at two scenarios. One is the, the classic, mono, what we call the monolithic magma chamber, where the whole eight kilometer thickness of the Bushveld complex uh, formed rather quickly in, in a period of time similar to the Cawthorn and Walraven time estimate of, you know, of something like 80,000 years. Uh, rapid emplacement of, sorry, of, of the complex uh, to the point at which it was mushy and no longer capable of internal convection. So it had cooled throughout its thickness to its, um, to the, to the uh, not the solidus, but to the temperature below which the, there were too, so many crystals that it wouldn't affect. And so henceforth, it would only be able to cool by conduction. Uh, and if you do that, then you find here I've plotted depth in the crust versus time going this way, and the contours and the colors represent temperature. So the whole system starts out close to the solidus or the effective solidus system at a temperature around 11, 1200 degrees C at, at this time. We put it at 2056.4 million years, and, and it remains hot and, and still quite mushy in the middle until about 2056 uh, MA, so a long span of time, about 400,000 years, uh, but it cools rather more quickly on the outside because it's cooling by conduction from the outside in. And so this hatched area here shows the range of temperatures within which zircons would grow according to our 
uh, thermochem uh, geothermometry and, and that of others by Zay et al. Uh, and so rocks close to the edge should have started crystallizing zircon at this age, and rocks, sorry, close to the middle, like this blue box here, which represents the entire thickness of the upper critical of the critical zone, all should have crystallized zircon somewhere within this time span. But we find instead that we have zircons that pass through this this cooling temperature at which zircon would grow over this much greater span of time, about 800,000 800, years. Uh, and similar results actually come out of the work from, from the Zay group. And we're not the only ones who find this big space. <clears throat> so to see whether this, this cell emplacement idea could account for these, these ages, we did another model. Well, this is all Sam Robb's model, and he did it with my input, my supervision. So this figure is a little harder to follow, but <clears throat> we've still got time going this way, uh, depth going this way, and the temperatures are, are shown with this color scheme. So he proposed one of an infinite number of possible cooling histories. He said, well, okay, suppose the upper critical zone norites were in place first, <clears throat> and then into the upper critical zone, the UG1 was in place about uh, 50,000 years later, that little upper critical zone mass of norite would actually have cooled fairly quickly. So by the time the UG1 appears in this possible scenario, its wall rocks would have been fairly cool. And the UG1 stack being quite thin itself would cool very quickly. It has almost no noticeable impact on the thermal evolution of the rocks around it. And then a while later, the main zone is in place. So for a while, the, the depth extent of the main zone here is, is hot and and mushy, and it doesn't actually start crystallizing um, zircon until a couple of hundred thousand years after it was in place. And we got our main zone age here in the middle of that. This is where our main zone sample was taken. And sometime during that process, the middle group four could have been in place. You can see we've, we've, we've taken the actual ages we've got for these rocks and stuck them into a, a, a hypothetical cooling history for the whole complex. And the point of this is to show that you could find that these things would be emplaced into relatively cool older rocks and, and themselves cool quite quickly, freezing in zircon ages, essentially their, their time of emplacement, including the UG2, <clears throat> and thereby produce the span of ages that we actually see. If the system evolved by this episodic emplacement of much thinner bodies of magma, each of which was allowed to cool and crystallize on its own. Uh, we wouldn't say that this is exactly what happened. This is just one of many possible scenarios that would allow us to see this, this range of cooling histories. And it all has to do with the zircon closure temperature. If our estimate of the zircon closure temperature is wrong, then, then maybe uh, our idea wouldn't work, but no matter how you cut it, it's very hard. It's really impossible to account for this range of ages <clears throat> with uh, a single cooling magma body. Our thermodynamic models uh, for the, the petrogenesis of the layers are, are, are nicely sort of exemplified by this model here, which is illustrated here with this uh, bivariate plot of alumina here on, on the y-axis and, and NGO on the x-axis. And in this model, we took a, a garden variety uh, uh, comatiite and mixed it with upper crust. And, and this is an assimilation batch crystallization scenario where the, the melt and the solids remain at equilibrium because of some kind of process of physical re-entrainment of the crystals. And if that system is allowed to reach thermal equilibrium at 1170 degrees C, you'll have something which is about a little more than half liquid, 37% uh, orthopyroxene, a little bit of clinopyroxene, and a bit of chrome spinel. And if you take these phases and then you allow solids to accumulate, so this the bulk composition, this mixture plots here where it says bulk in the middle. Now, can you see here? I'll, maybe I'll go back to the pointer. Rotate. No, never mind. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Go 
I'm back to now. Sorry about that. Um, the bulk composition is here. This liquid is sitting here, the solids are sitting here. And if you make a mixture of 75% solids and 25% liquids, it sits here, which is almost bang on the bulk composition of the UG2 package, shown in red here. And the composition of the B1 magmas, which are largely thought to be, you know, brought, many people think that they're the complements to the UG2 uh, peroxinate. Their composition, their average composition plots here and our model composition plots here, if it's allowed to contain about 25% solids. So it was a porphyritic uh, liquid which escaped and left behind uh, a crystal mush with the composition of the UG2. Uh, and we're not the first to say this. Uh, Eels suggested something very similar in 2012. Uh, and if you take that, that, that reasoning and apply it to, um, to the trace elements, taking the trace element compositions of all of these phases and mixing them up together, you get a very nice match between um, model and, and observation. So our model upper crust is the orange squares. Our model chromatiate is the green triangles. It's a real chromatiate from Australia. Uh, and the, the B1 magma model is the red squares Sorry, the, the model is the open squares, the actual B1 is the red squares, and the, uh, the cumulate model is the open circles, and the cumulate, the average of the, the, the UG2 peroxinate is, is the red circles. And this is just a spider diagram showing some, some lithophile elements, uh, normalized to primitive mantle. So the point here is that if you make, and, and I made this model, First of all, just based on, on the major elements, and then I looked to see how the trace elements would go, and this is what I saw. So, it, and it, you know, that, that's fairly encouraging when a model works that way. Um, and there's an excess in the UG2 of chromite. It's got more than 1% chrome spinel, and it also has an excess of sulfide liquid, which is what was the, what produced the platinum deposit. But in, in the scenario that I showed you, in, in the little uh, uh, analog modeling that I showed you, you can see how for a long period of time with a high flow rate, your basal layer can accumulate dense crystals like chromite and the dense phase like, like sulfide, while the silicates just continuously swept away. And they won't begin to accumulate until the flow rate drops. Uh, and again, that's something that Eel suggested a long time ago. And, and so I think that it's quite plausible that we could have an excess of chromite and still see the, the silicates behaving the way that this model predicts. If that system uh, collected dense phases for a while before it slowed down enough to start uh, dropping out the, the chromate, the, the orthopyroxene and eventually the plagioclase. I won't dwell on this figure. It's in this paper that we published, um, I guess it was last year, it just shows that we can play the same game as this for every cumulate rock type that's been identified in the Russenberg Laird suite, except in the upper zone. Uh, and you can use exactly the same kind of reasoning to generate the entire span of cumulate rocks in, in the critical zone and the main zone and the lower zone. And, and we extended that coverage to the isotopes as well as the trace elements. And it all actually fit together really nicely. So I'm, happy with that model. As I always say, models don't prove anything, but they demonstrate that, a, that an idea is at least plausible. And, and I think it shows that this idea can, can account for what we see throughout the Laird suite. And just to show that I'm not prejudiced against fractional crystallization models, um, for the upper zone, we were not able to use that batch crystallization model to produce what's, what's observed. The only way, this is all modeling that Yao did actually after an initial sort of preliminary work by me. For the upper zone, he had to resort to fractional crystallization. And these model trends here show stratigraphic position in the upper and upper main zone sequence. And these are mineral compositions. So plagioclase, high calcium pyroxene, low calcium pyroxene, and olivine. He used alpha melts, the same as we did for the other models. And his fractional crystallization trends are these black lines here. And then when he includes a trap liquid shift, 
for equilibration between the little bit of trapped melt and, and the solids that are accumulating by fractional crystallization, he gets a trend that runs exactly through the blue dots here, which are the data for the western limb uh, of the upper and upper main zone. So we're totally happy with the idea that the upper zone formed in a big tank type magma chamber uh, via a process of fractional crystallization. Uh, but in the detail, when, when you see layers of magnetotite, then you need to expand your, your modeling beyond this simple scenario. There's something funny going on with the magnetotites, which uh, people have suggested, I think, quite convincingly involved some kind of double diffusive convection process uh, and maybe a few magma recharge events. So I'm almost done here with the modeling section. I'm almost done actually with the talk, therefore. This is the last bit of, of, of new stuff for the for wrap up. So the main magnetite layer in the upper zone looks like this in outcrop. It's a, it's a block of magnetite, uh, you know, tens of centimeters thick, which is apparently continuous around <clears throat> most of the upper zone. It sits on top of a northosite. And of course, its origin is, is interesting and it has economic significance because this is one of the world's main repositories for uh, magmatic vanadium, because there's vanadium in the magnetite. And the distribution of chromium is shown here in uh, some work that, that uh, Kruger and Ladipov published a couple of years ago now. So the crosses here indicate compositions that they measured on the face of the magnetite using handheld X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. And, and the interesting thing here is that the chromium concentration decreases upward, as has been known for a long time. But it also, by, by looking at a number of points along the outcrop, they found that it had this sort of nodular or no nodal texture, where the chromium concentrations are higher at discrete points along the lower contact. And then there's concentric zoning in chromium concentration as you go up and away from these, from these nodes. And their explanation for this was that the Magnetite grew by nucleating in situ on the base of the, the magma chamber on top of a substrate of solid northosite. And then the, the magnetite crystals grew outward, almost you can think of like growing stromatolites on the bottom of a reef, uh, so that you got concentric growth of, of these chromium rich magnetites around these initial nucleation sites, which then eventually grew laterally until they coalesced as they also grew upwards. And they ran a number of different systems in their model and, and, and always got the similar kind of result. And, and that looked quite convincing. And, and it's a nice piece of work. But when I saw that, I thought, well, you could also get that if you were, if you had a, a mush. And this, so this is modeling that Yao did, where you start with a mush of magnetite, uh, either with uniform compositions or with compositions dictated by fractional crystallization. We're able to get the same result either way. Uh, but the, the key thing happening here was we suggested that if there were zones of different porosity in the underlying anorthosite, you could get focused flow of intercumulus melt percolating up through this pile of magnetite. And if that uh, melt that was percolating up started out in an anorthosite that was magnetite undersaturated, it would contain relatively high chromium concentration. And so doing these models of reactive transport and, and, and porous flow, yeah, I was able to show that you get these, these nodal distributions of chromium in that manner also. So you can get these chromium distributions both with the in situ model or by uh, porous flow through a, a rather thick uh, sorry, a rather rapidly formed open uh, crystal mush of magnetite. Uh, and we argued in our paper that uh, there were a lot fewer adjustable parameters in our model than there were in the in situ model. So using Occam's razor, we tended to, to favor our model, but you can't prove either way just based on models. So just to wrap up here, in summary, the, the idea of mush emplacement is supported by a number of lines of evidence. There's lots of evidence around the world for crystal transport and sorting that phenocrysts that carried by melts uh, will form, will collect in, in these mushy co-accumulated textures. And 
in, in many cases, we see heterogenetic evidence that the, the, these cumulates must have formed by equilibrium crystallization of batches of crystals that were all at equilibrium with each other and with the melt. And, and the fact that we get these broad ranges of non-cotectic modal abundances also demands crystal transport and sorting. Uh, and, and we can duplicate the, the consequences of these processes of transport and, and sorting of, of mushes with these uh, thermodynamic models that, that work simultaneously for major and trace elements and isotopes and the mineral compositions. For in-situ crystallization, uh, well, the fact that we see evidence for mushes throughout most of the complex tends to work against them. We, we lack textural evidence for in-situ crystal growth. We don't see heresitic textures and, and other sort of unidirectional growth textures where you might expect to see it. Uh, and the one example that, that was used as, a, as a ironclad evidence for in-situ crystallization, this chromium distribution, the magnetite, we've shown that it can equally well and perhaps better be explained by porous flow through mushy cumulates than by in-situ models. So in summary, the, the Skergard complex clearly formed as a small example of a big tank. The upper zone of the Bushfeld complex may have formed, probably was formed as a big tank, but the rest of, of the Rustenberg layered suite is, is problematic. And, and I think that there's fairly good evidence that the layers were formed as dense crystal rich flows, which may have been on the bottom of a big tank, uh, they could be, or they could have formed at least some of them as discrete sill-like intrusions within pre-existing cumulates. And, and that idea of at least some of them being sills supported by these rather bizarre crystallization ages, which appear to, to, to require things being in place beneath other things. Uh, but I'll admit that there are still some issues with the dating and, and we need to to firm up even better, I think, our interpretations of those ages. So in conclusion, magma chambers can form either as big tanks or as stacks of mush with transient melt bodies within them. The Bushfeld looks to me more like a mush stack than a big tank. And, and bringing this back around to my original question, which is of more concern to me working outside of South Africa, um, it's important for mineral exploration because if you can form uh, a mass of rock that has the same things in it as let's say the Marinsky Reef. So a peroxinite mush with an excess amount of, of trapped sulfide liquid that's rich in PGEs. If you can form that somewhere that's not a layer in a layered intrusion, then uh, that means that the whole world opens up as places to look for the platinum deposits. But if the process that generated that sulfide rich layer could only operate in a big tank, then you have to continue to restrict your attention to big tank layered intrusions, which really narrows the scope. Uh, and we think that we do see places like this, the Lactazil complex that we're working on right now in Northwestern Ontario uh, looks exactly like a, a potato shaped uh, Marinsky reef. It doesn't look like a layer, but it has the same rock types in it. Uh, so, I think that we've got good reasons to stop looking only in layered intrusions for, for the deposit types that you might associate with the Bushfeld. And that's it. So I'm sorry I ran so far over. That's fine. Thanks, James. That's great stuff. And um, I see we've already got some comments, questions in the chat box, but let's, um, if, you, if you stop sharing and people can open up their videos and sure. some questions and answers discussion going. Okay, good stuff. Um, who, who wants to kick off from sort of um, our more traditional Bushveld colleagues? Um, can can we start here? Um, yeah, we've got, sure. I've also got Grant Clothorn here, who's going to start. Great. Right. Sure. Okay, so just, just shout to you. Yeah. Hi everybody, Grant Clothorn. Hello, Jane. Thank you I, have three, I have three questions I'd like to, to ask you. Let's mm -hmm. start with the ages. Um, yeah. You showed that there were two samples of Marensky Reef uh, and they, uh, Zircon in the Marensky Reef, and they differed 
by nearly half a million years in age. You showed two samples of the UG2, where the zircon differed by half a million years in age. So if, if they can differ by that much and there's still one single layer of rock, I think your model has a problem. Second mm -hmm. layer I'd like to point out that if you want to inject a chromite mush, you've got a density problem for one thing, chromite is very dense. Secondly, to have made the amount of chromite that we see in these layers means that we must have had a huge open tank at depth. Thirdly, I'd like to point out that um, Marian Holness showed that directly beneath the main magnetite layer, there was no porous mush. She showed, based on um, the um, dihedral angle study, that in fact, the, the anorthosite below the main magnetite layer was totally solid, about uh, three or four meters below the main magnetite, and there is no large amount of porous porosity for a chromium-rich liquid. Also, the work that McCarthy and I did many years ago showed that the chromium content in the magnetite below the main magnetite layer was very, very much lower than in the main magnetite. So you can't pump up the chromium content in those nodes with porous flow. Okay. Sorry, James, it's a, lot, it's a lot for you to remember. I apologize. That's okay. Um, I'll go back. I'd like to share my screen again. Yeah. And uh, so, first of all, the dates. Sounds like uh, making excuses. I have no <laughs> There's a slide, and I forgot to fix it. I was using an old version of the figure. Um, oh, we're in the wrong place again. To go back. <laughs> what I'll tell you is that there, the Marinsky reef ages actually are the same. There was a problem with the way it was plotted, and I apologize for that. Um, this was because of something that was done by uh, by Sam when he was putting together this figure. And honestly, I just used the wrong one. The, the Marinsky reef dates match very nicely within a fairly small error bar. However, the UG2 ages are a big problem. And we're working on that right now. And Sandra Camo has gone back. We have gone and collected, well, we didn't collect, we, we've assembled a collection of samples that other people collected. We have a, a pegmatite cross-cutting the Atok section very close to where James Goetz's UG2 age comes from. And we have a sample of peroxinite from the same uh, Ed Maté collection that James Scott stated from just one meter from his sample. And we have a UG2, we have two other UG2 samples from around the complex. And Sandra is dating all of those, but it takes her time because this is sort of moonlighting for her. It's not part of her regular work that keeps the lab work. So she's a bit slow. The problem is that Scotes's age for the for the uh, UG two is different from everybody else's, uh, and we haven't resolved that yet. Um, it could be an interlab bias. It could be well, we don't know, but uh, all of our UG two ages are coming up equal to the one that was published by Zay et al. So we think that. If you just consider our data set and Zay's, that the, the, that the age discrepancies will be resolved and that will we'll be left with the question of why our dates differ from the UBC group. Uh, that's all I can say about the ages. Um, the next point was about the accumulation of chromite. Yeah. And the mass balance problem. Mm -hmm. So if you, you look at this, distribution of phases right here at the top left. This is something that we've, we've tried to make clear, but if you don't read our papers super carefully, and I don't blame anybody for not reading them super carefully, um, but if you take this mixture of chromatite and upper crust and you allow it to equilibrate, so you got about 1% chromium spinel, that spinel has 
uh, and a, a composition that matches the UG2 chromatite, but there's not enough of it by a factor of about, I forget exactly, it's something like six times or eight times. And so the amount of magma that's missing that you'd need to account for that sort of 65 centimeter to a meter thick layer is, is a few hundred meters. Or I forget exactly the numbers, but, but I've published these numbers before and, and, and I've made the same argument for the platinum that's contained in the Marinsky Reef. There it's about, you need 250 meters of magma from that Marinsky unit to produce or to, to deposit the amount of platinum that's in the Marinsky Reef. You need a similar sort of quantity uh, of magma to produce the amount of chromium that's in, in, contained in the UG2 chromatite. So yes, there's a missing mass problem, but it's not a factor of tens or thousands, I'm sorry, of hundreds or thousands. We're looking at a factor of maybe 10. So one of these packages, which we, which we think came in together as chromite plus orthopyroxene crystals suspended in a slurry represents something like 10% of the volume of the batch of magma that passed through the system. So we're, we're looking at the possibility that 10 times that much melt exited the system and is somewhere in the marginal zone. Using the people used to make, you needed like a thousand times as much. And it was a huge problem. The reason why, just let me finish, please. The reason why is because we're starting with a chromatiite liquid, which has thousands of parts per million chromium in it. And the liquid resulting after you've extracted all that chromite is the, uh, the B1 magma. If you start with the B1 magma, then you really have a mass balance problem. If it's the melt that was equilibrated with the batch of chromite that was already removed, then the mass balance problem becomes much, much less of a problem. Okay. For the, for the anorthite under the magnetite, our suggestion then would be, and I'm sorry we didn't address this actually in the paper, um, when you, and, and I've seen this in, in the Sudbury complex, for example, when the magnetite rich layer in the Sudbury complex formed on top of, of, uh, of norites, there's a zone of highly compacted norite directly underneath the, the magnetite rich layer. In, in Sudbury. And I would expect the same thing anywhere that you suddenly deposit a whack of dense minerals on top of a porous mush, it will tend to squeeze out the interstitial melt. And it's the squeezing out process that would cause the, uh, the process that we were suggesting. And the end product would be magnetite sitting on top of an ad cumulate, an orthocyte. But at the time when, when the process that we're envisioning was taking place, there would have still been open space and trapped liquid in the north site. But the magnetite in that footwall is low in chromium. The magnetite in that footwall is low in chromium. Yeah. Well, if it equilibrated with that melt and continued to equilibrate with that melt down to the solidus, then the trap liquid shift would diminish the average concentration in the magnetite crystals, whereas the, the, the ones sitting right on the bottom of the pile of magnetite would have, would have seen a continuous flow of chromium rich melt, and they wouldn't have had that same trap liquid shift acting on them. Okay. Other, other questions? Thanks, Grant, and thanks, James, for that, that response. Um, I'll, I'll come back to my comments a bit later on. But, um, James, can you look at the chat box? There was a comment yes. question, I guess, by mm -hmm. Nils and, and Ben. And, and, and it's important, and I think very positive, that you raise the economic aspect as well. Um, have you have some questions on the ring of fire and what you think Wilo is doing? What will we see? I can follow up another time. But <laughs> maybe sort of comment on the- I have no your comment. Ring, your ring of fire. I won't say I won't say a word, speculate about what make the investment decisions they make. Yeah. I've got okay. Susan Red's hand up. Susan. One? Hi, yes. Um, I had a, a quick question on your analog experiment. Um, <laughs> the, the layer of uh, magnetite falling out. 
And then yeah. the, the second magnetite layer above it, was, was that a different grain size or was there anything different about it? Uh, it just really was interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I've been puzzling over that too. And I haven't done enough. I just did that little run last week, like two days before I came up here on vacation. Uh, there's been a lot more work happening. I'm actually taking that thing and I'm going to dry it down so it becomes gummy enough that I can then drill a core sample out of it. And we'll do a 3D CT scan on it uh, to see, answer questions like that. What I suspect is that what I did, there was a step change in the flow rate. Oh, okay. So if I'd let that run go longer, as I have other times, then all of the magnetite would have ended up on the bottom layer. And then when I slowed the speed of the paddles, then the quartz would have come out and I would have had a clean layer of quartz on top. But because it hadn't had time to gather all of the magnetite yet, when I slowed the velocity, at first the magnetite and the quartz came out simultaneously. But then there was a size fraction of the quartz that remained suspended. So after most of the quartz had come out, then the little bit of magnetite that was still in that slurry then started to settle again. Hmm. Second time, because it still hadn't all had a chance to come out. Uh, but I'll have to do a lot more runs. This is still early days. I'm planning to, to systematically vary the viscosity, vary the run times, and vary the speed. I'm going to have to shell out for another steering unit so I can control the speed a little more carefully. I thought that was interesting. And I, I wondered about any magnetic interactions also, if you were doing it with chromite. Yeah, I'm planning. I do have a bag of chromite. From, uh, from one of the mines, which I'm planning to, to throw into the fray once I'm sure that everything is working properly uh, to, to dispel that concern. But I wouldn't expect the magnite to have, magnetite to have enough remnant magnetism to stick to itself. I haven't noticed any, anything of that, even when it's just in air. Not unless I bring a magnet into play, you know. But the, the magnetite grains don't seem to be interacting with each other magnetically. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks. Okay. G Gordon, do you want to verbalize your comments in the chat box? Gordon Chanet? Well, just my observation there, are we sure that it is magnetite? So, I mean, I know you said you started off with magnetite, but the, the, the upper layer may be something else. Um, so check that it is magnetite, but it also may be a function of grain size. Uh, Absolutely. Very fine, very fine particles forming the upper layer. Um, and it may be something less, something less than magnetite, I don't know. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Right? And thank you yeah, again. No, that's right. very, very good talk. Um, well worth uh, catching the recording and, and going through it one more time. Well, thanks. Thanks. And and just just a general question, James. I mean, and and for Grant and Sue and that. Uh, I mean, what what on what ongoing you know new work is still happening on the bushveld, or has that um, has that sort of quietened down or almost died? For myself, you mean? Yeah, by yourself and others, for that matter. Yeah. But but you're asking me. Yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, Sue can come, on, come in as well when you finish. Yeah, I, I don't expect to be going back to South Africa. So I'm stuck working with samples and, and the observations that I made back in the day, which was quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, we've got this, we're, we're going to try and finish this dating work. And, and we'll, I'm sure we're going to be publishing a, a paper where we just sort of question the reproducibility of the Scots ages. And then it'll be up to the Geochron, Geochron community to follow up on that with some more work. Um, <clears throat> we will be, uh, there's stuff, there's unfinished work. I had a student do a bunch of experiments testing the idea that if you, if you heat up norite on the margins of one of these hot zones, whether or not it's a basal flow forming potholes or a sill, either way, then, then you expect it to heat, to reheat and partially melt the, the foot wall norite. And we did melting experiments and have nice uh, run products from that that I've never put together in a paper. And I expect to get that done sooner or later. It might have to wait until I retire, which might happen soon. 
Um, there's just a ton of data that I haven't published that I would like to get out there, even just to share it with everyone. We spend a lot of time and, and money on microprobe work and so on. Good. Okay. Oh, Sue, really? You... No. Okay. Sue, do you want to update who's working on the comment there? Yeah, I'm coming to that, Annie. Sue? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say our ICDP project is just getting going. Um, we've just had confirmation from um, Impala Platinum about being able to drill on their property. And so we're going ahead probably in March, April next year. We, we should be drilling two 1500 meter research boreholes in the uh, eastern limb of the Bushveld. So uh, we're very, very excited about it. And, um, you know, we're still inviting science um, proposals. So talk to us. Yeah, I'm, I'm really yeah, excited. Okay. About it. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. Fantastic. And is Impala paying for that? No, I wish. Um, but but in, in Impala's defense, um, Impala has donated over six kilometers of core to the project. So and and complete donations. So those are down at University of Free State at the moment, and they've already been entered into the uh, ICDP database. So you can go on to the um, they call it MDIS on the ICDP site. And start requesting samples, and and, and um, you know see see what's been accumulated there already. So it's really an exciting project, and um, we're currently working on some donated core, the ZF 7 core, um, and also Bellevue has been donated um, by the Council for Geoscience as you know as part of this particular project. So we're we're looking at an entire section through the northern limb. And also an entire section through the eastern limb. So it's um, it's very exciting to me to have these kind of reference sections. You know, it doesn't mean that's like the Bushveld section. It's just something we can refer to and compare. So yeah, yeah. very exciting. That, that is exciting. Can who's I make a suggestion? It? Sorry, Sorry. who's coordinating it to yourself? Yeah, it's kind of landed in my lap. So. <laughs> I, I, um, we're doing it through Chimera because they have recently finished the um, Barberton um, um, ICDP project. So the base project, if you're looking for that. Um, so we're, we're able to capitalize or on their um, paperwork already, you know, the contracts and things like that they're, they're helping us with because they've just done that. So um, that's a big help having a lot of that paperwork, you know, having a first draft of it is, is a huge help. So we're, that's why we're running it through Chimera. And getting back to the cost thing, the, um, you know, the majority of the, the, the cash is coming obviously from ICDP because South Africa is a member country now. And, um, but the, um, they were willing to accept um, the core as kind of in-kind value donation. Yeah. So, which is really kind of a first. And this is the first economic um, ICDP project that's been done. So that's really exciting. Fantastic. So you're going to get Grant Cawthorn out of retirement and get Chunit back in the field there as well. Well, the invitation is open. Grant's sitting right here. He's smiling. He's smiling so that's good. <laughs> and, and, and Samer, Samer, you've got a comment about the amount of um, magma or melting that you need. Do you want to comment on that? I don't know if James is able to look at that in, in his chat box as well. Sure. Okay, yeah, I see three new messages here. Yeah. So Sam has, Sam has made an interesting comment about melts, melt, melt modeling shows that. Mm -hmm. Are you there, Sam? Yeah, I, I was telling that uh, my recent melt model shows that even by fractional crystallization of D1 only, no more than of about uh, 500 meter of melt is required. We don't need collections of melt for one meter chromatite layer in the bushel complex. If we consider about uh, 0.3 uh, uh, chromium oxide, uh, or chromium solubility, uh, we can get about 33% uh, of chromium extraction for 
uh, B1. Uh, so there is only, uh, we need only 500 kilometers. And, <clears throat> and if uh, we mix uh, B1 with, with B2, we can get uh, uh, chromium, uh, chromium extraction of up to 40%. Per, 40%. So basically, uh, the thickness of the melt uh, would reduce to 200, 250 meters. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, well, I guess, we've I guess, seen, go on, James, your turn now. We, we've seen this in, in a number of places. I started thinking this way uh, in the ring of fire chromatites, where we had to explain the formation of 70 meters of chromatite. <laughs> and the only way that I could account for that was by some mechanical sorting process. So looking at the mass balance of the, the melt, the, the olivine and the chromite as a whole, and, and allowing myself to think that the, the chromite was being moved from place to place and, and sorted into layers, then yeah, we didn't end up needing much of an excess of liquid to, to generate the amount of chromite that's in those layers. And, and it's been done, like you say, you can do it. There's a number of different ways you can mix and match magmas. If you allow yourself to separate the chromite from the silicates, it, it becomes way, way easier. Uh, forcing your model to produce the chromite by fractional crystallization from a melt that's only saturated with chromite alone is very difficult. Yeah. Using the batch model where, where things can be separated from each other, like I showed in, the, in the, my little analog experiment, it really lessens the problem a lot. Uh, good stuff, Hag Mr. Hag Stephen Haggerty, you're very quiet there for a mineralogist. Not talking to us. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I, I guess I guess the positive for me, being being a sort of old citizen now and having watched the bushveld and all its amazing mineral deposits for years, it's great to see some new and interesting ideas. And you know, Sue, great to hear that there's a whole new project about to happen. So, so we look forward to you know the, the new developments and the new data and and whatever that comes out of it in the years to come. But um, credit to all of those who put it together as well. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to suggest something to Sue as a as a way of thinking about how to handle the core. As soon as you said that you know people could request samples, I was thinking about erosion of the collection and things not coming back and so on. But one thing that comes to my mind is that you don't need to make thin sections. You can grind off a flat surface and make an X-ray map of that at very high resolution now, and even go back later and, and, and examine it at even higher resolution in an electron microscope uh, without really removing very much material at all. So that the, the core sample itself isn't compromised. Just a thought that came into my head because we've started doing this here in, at home the samples that we want to take care of. We just grind off one face and mount it parallel and, and scan it in the in the SEM without cutting it up. Great idea. Can, can you send me something about that? I'd really appreciate it. And um, yeah, the half of the core will actually be um, um, you know kept long term as right. as the reference section and the other half is available for for studies so and that right. will be kept here in south africa which we're very excited about it'll it'll be hosted at the um national core library at donker hook that's wonderful that's such a great resource so yeah. that after i've retired people can come along and prove me wrong <laughs> Okay, well, thanks everyone. I think um, at this end of the continent or the world, it's getting towards supper time. And I guess James probably needs a, um, a late breakfast by now. But thanks, James, that was tremendous. And All right. um, thanks everyone for, for coming can, in. And for hearing James, me. can you turn your camera back on for one minute? Uh, yeah, start share. So I, I just wanted to get a picture for, for our... Uh... <laughs> It's a mug shot. Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> Anybody else who wants their camera on? <laughs> so you don't want me. Oh, sure. <laughs> Have I got you? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Okay, okay thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Bye.
Thanks, James. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us from the distance. And thanks to everyone who pitched up um, for the presentation. I know the notification was a bit late in the day, but right. it was great to see and, and was great to see new faces as well. Herman, I'll give you a call on WhatsApp in a, in a minute or two. You're still there. Yeah, I'm thanks, still here. Uh, yeah, I'll be waiting for the call. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your evening or enjoy your mornings wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks.